So I've worked for about 20 years in uh, EdTech standards. Uh, the reason I'll tell you a little bit uh, about my background, the reason I think EdTech standards are so important, because they sound a bit dry, is I think they're essential uh, for software, for the data interoperability, because there's a lot of talk mm -hmm. now about big data, and passing data around between programs is important uh, to developing education-specific software. Um, I've become a bit of a maverick because I criticize quite a lot of the ways that education technology has been done over those 20 years, um, and maybe that will become uh, clearer. So I'm going to run through what I think are 10 things which are missing from MOOCs. And the first, which I don't think is a particularly important one, is a business model. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about the fact that the MOOC platforms uh, don't have a business model, and that's not really a problem for the businessmen. They'll find a business model. If it's cool, they'll find a way of monetizing it. The problem in that is for the educators who may not like the business model that, uh, that eventually emerges. If it's about selling student data or advertising, that may not be what you're looking for. So it's not, not a critical problem, uh, but it is something to bear in mind. The second problem, the second thing that's missing, which I think is absolutely fundamental, is definition. What do we actually mean by a MOOC? Um, quite a lot of people, I think Donald uh, included, have criticised the idea of a course. So we're actually supporting massive open online courses, but don't like the idea of a course. Um, I said at a debate in Berlin uh, that Oxford and Cambridge had not touched <coughs> MOOCs with a barge pole uh, because they are not happy about the pedagogy that they're using. Uh, and one of the guys from edX who I was debating against said, well, no, you got that completely wrong. There are lots of dons in Oxford and Cambridge who are using MOOCs with their students. Well, there's a difference, obviously, between a, a, an individual don and the university as an institution. But the key point about that is if you're using it with your students on campus, it's not massive and it's not open. So in many cases, we're talking about massive open online courses that are not massive, that are not open, and that are not a course. And we're using terminology in a very unclear way. The only thing that's left is that they are online. And we've had online learning for 50 years. Um, so the reason why we have such unclear terminology is that MOOCs are a bandwagon and that everyone's jumping on the bandwagon. And there are lots of different people jumping on the bandwagon who want to steer it in different directions. You have a bunch of people who are interested in what's called connectivist MOOCs. Uh, and the, the essence of connectivist MOOCs is that you are creating your own knowledge and your own priorities uh, in a social network. There are another bunch of guys who came over from the States, and this was the major uh, US-based MOOC platforms, Coursera and edX, who were saying they could completely disrupt higher education and offer the equivalent of degree-level courses. Okay? And what they're offering is the equivalent of very traditional education, artificial intelligence. Etc. That's not a bunch of knowledge that you make up for yourself or you define in your community. There is a set curriculum out there which you've got to master. That's a totally different objective. And then maybe as MOOCs are evolving, they're becoming more pragmatic, a little bit less ambitious. We see universities using them as a sort of advertising uh, mechanism, as a sort of taster course, or as I suggested earlier, they're being used in blended environments uh, with traditional classroom delivery methods. Uh, and then that's not actually what the MOOC was. So we have a lot of different people meaning a lot of different things by MOOCs. And I, that's really my key point. I don't think that is very useful in forwarding the debate about education technology because I think over the last 20 years, one of the things we've suffered from is terminology that doesn't mean what it says on the tin. The third thing that's missing, and this is a common point, is retention. Uh, of course, statistics are difficult to interpret, but generally there's consensus that retention rates in MOOCs are somewhere between 5 and 7%. Yeah. Up to about 95% of people who sign up for the MOOC drop out. And a lot of the people who are in favour of MOOCs say that doesn't matter. Uh, because if you have a massive uh, subscription, then you've still got a fairly large number of people who are completing. And it's inevitable if it's, an, if it's a free and optional course, uh, lots of people will drop out just to have, you know, uh, lots of people will subscribe, um, and that's just part of that subscription process. Uh, Donald has said in, uh, online that he's in favour of drop in, not drop out. Uh, and that's fine, it's a more informal thing. You, you drop in, you do a little bit of learning, you drop out, whatever suits you. And that's fine in a sort of adult education evening class type space, informal, browse around, find what suits you. 
it's not the equivalent of degree courses, which require perseverance and, uh, and, and discipline and extensive learning. So again, this comes back to what we mean, wh what our objectives are. Uh, the next thing, I think we're on to number four. four. Thank you. If you can keep count of the, the, the numbers, that would be really helpful. Um, the next thing is uh, what I call penetration. Penetration into the formal education market. Most of the people, about 80% of the people who sign up to the MOOCs are already graduates. Uh, and a lot of them are doctors or professors. Now, uh, again, people, I think, including Donald, have said, well, that doesn't matter, that's just, they're the early adopters. They're the guys that it's been marketed to now. Later, you'll get everybody else. The problem is that the type of education that is appropriate to a professor is totally different to the type of education that's appropriate to an undergraduate. The undergraduate is developing their capability to think critically, to write essays. The professor's done all that. All they're doing is applying those skills in a new context, discussing with new people, uh, right, uh, uh, picking up some more information. Uh, so professors can make sense of uh, the MOOC pedagogy. It, it, it will help them. It is not helping the undergraduates, or at least there's no evidence that it's helping the undergraduates because there are very, very few of them signing up for these things. Next, it lacks what I would call currency, uh, which basically I mean certification or something at the end of it which shows what you have achieved, which you can cash in. Now, Donald, I know, is against degrees and certifications because at Online Educa Berlin in 2012, he spoke against it. I spoke in Online Educa to Berlin this year against MOOCs, and we lost the debate heavily. Um, Maybe because the audience, maybe that was my debating skills, maybe that was to do with the fact that the audience were a lot of professors who spent their time doing MOOCs. Um, the year previously, Donald won his debate, uh, saying that degrees, courses, degrees and certification should be banned. Not that we disapprove of them, but they should be banned. So you're against this sort of idea that you get something at the end of the course that could be cashed in and that could show what you've achieved. Well, that will depend on, on what the demand is. I suspect that in business, and I suspect in the, in the ex-MOOCs, the traditional guys, Harvard and MIT, they are very interested in, in certi certificated courses. But if you don't have those certificates, what is your evidence that anything valuable has been achieved? Maybe something valuable has been achieved for the participant, but how does anyone else know? And so that, I think, is a problem in... Uh, a lot of markets for education, where I, I think, you know, Donald is a bit of a revolutionary. He wants to completely change the way we do education. I think he's got a, a tall mountain to climb there. Sixth, which I think is related to the lack of certification, the lack of currency, is learning objectives. There's a big debate going on at the moment in ed tech uh, about learning objectives. And a lot of the way a lot of people express it is they attack the deficit model of education. And a lot of this is they say that, that there are parallels being made with medicine. That in medicine, you go into the hospital because you're sick. And we're treating students as if there's something wrong with them. They're sick. Um, but I think that comes down to a, to a misunderstanding about the deficit. In medicine, the deficit, the deficit in health, is relative to a norm. We regard health as normal. Everyone who is ill is somehow pathological, is below normal. In education, the deficit is not related to a norm, it's related to your learning objective. I might be an Olympic athlete, I want to get the gold model. I am still have a deficit on where I want to be. Now the question is, do we think education is about bringing people up to define learning objectives? Or do we, as a lot of people in the connectivist uh, community think, that education is simply about finding uh, myself, expressing myself? So there is a debate around a lot of these MOOCs, which is actually critical of the whole model of objective-led learning. Seven, and this is really, I think, key, is pedagogy. Now, um, Donald has blogged that he doesn't like the word pedagogy, as one of, I think, the, the words he doesn't like in the previous year, uh, because I think you see it as akin to lecturing, or fairly traditional forms of transmission. I don't see pedagogy like that. Pedagogy is basically the, the science or the technology of teaching. And I'd say there are two parts of teaching. If you lay aside subject knowledge, there's personality, inspiration. That's important. The other side of it 
is process and managing transactions, designing and sequencing learning activities, handling the transactional loop of performance and feedback. And that's a process-dominated thing. And that's not about lecturing. Lecturing fails to do that because in lecturing there is no feedback. And the critical thing in pedagogy, to my mind, is feedback. All the research shows that. In schools, assessment for learning research shows that feedback is absolutely critical. Now, we can give feedback at small scale. We've known how to do that ever since Socrates. You sit down one-to-one, -one, the tutor talks to the student, and you have a, comp you have a dialogue. Um, and that's very high-quality learning. It's what Oxford and Cambridge still do. But we can't do it at scale. And the big problem with education is doing it at scale. That's what we need to do. We need uh, to democratise education. I completely agree with Donald on that. But the problem with doing that is how we scale feedback and interaction. So I don't have any PowerPoints, you may have noticed, I, but I do have one slide which I want you to imagine. Uh, which is a triangle, a bit like as if I was uh, teaching uh, the feudal system to year nines or uh, a sort of British class system. And at the top of the triangle is the tutor. Very high interactivity, but very low scalability. At the bottom of the triangle are information resources. Websites, PowerPoints, Word documents. A lot of open education resources are just information resources. Um, very easily scalable, you can churn them out, uh, but very little interactivity. They don't actually deliver um, the, the feedback that you need. So where, what we need to do is we need to scale the feedback that we can deliver on a one-to-one -one basis, but we haven't been able to deliver at scale. And I think there are two ways of doing that. First is by peer instruction. So instead of having the teacher get people to talk peer-to-peer, and secondly is machine instruction, getting the software to do it to some degree. Now, both of those things are hard. The MOOCs have tried with peer instruction. There's a lot of emphasis on social networking, but they're very different approaches to this. Uh, if you're in a connectivist MOOC, you will go on a social network and you will develop uh, your own version of the knowledge. You will develop a consensus amongst the students. But what you don't get from your colleagues is authoritative feedback. There are ways of doing that. Uh, I recommend you look at what Eric Mazur is doing uh, in Harvard. Um, he has ways in which you, he asks the students a question, you get, a, you get an answer, you then discuss it with your neighbour, uh, you try and persuade your neighbour that your answer was better than theirs, you then answer the question again, ask, answer the question again, and finally you get the answer from uh, the lecturer. Diana Lorillard at the Institute of Education is talking about ways in which you can create peer interactions through pyramid structures. So you have a discussion on your group, you then, you then widen the discussion, uh, but at the end of that discussion you have some sort of authoritative feedback. So it's not just a question of going on Twitter uh, and having a discussion and building up a consensus. There's a lot of nonsense at the moment talked about the wisdom of the crowd. If you read the book, The Wisdom of the Crowd, it's not about consensual social networks. It's about contested debate, and that is what you need to, you need to achieve. On machine learning, and I'm not just talking about multiple choice, I'm talking about advanced uh, creative exercises, uh, gaming exercises, went to the, uh, the, 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 the talk earlier today about serious gaming. Uh, the problem with machine learning is you need to create the software. And at the moment, we've created very little education-specific software. So we need innovation in both those spaces, and the MOOCs haven't provided that innovation yet, because all they're doing generally are um, information resources, online video lectures, and, and two, unstructured peer-to-peer -peer conversations with a little bit of multiple choice. They're looking at developing automatic essay markers, that's where the future lies. It's in the development of the software. So the MOOCs may encourage innovation in this area. At the moment, they haven't, they haven't delivered it. So eight, related to that, is a lack of innovation. The MOOCs are really recycling a fairly old and well-established pedagogies um, that we've seen for a long time in online learning. And again, I saw Donald at uh, Online Educa Berlin 2012 saying, 
because you have your experience in university for industry, that our traditional models of online uh, learning do not are no cheaper than face-to-face -face because they're heavily dependent on personal tuition, remote tuition, but still you need a, a human tutor there, and that is expensive. So online learning without education software, without technical innovation, does not scale. It solves a different problem. It solves a problem of the isolated adult learner in the workplace. Nine, MOOCs are missing data. Now, there's a lot of talk about big data, and I think there's a lot of scope in using data to analyze what works, um, and also to uh, personalize learning uh, for the learner. However, uh, there's, there's a famous uh, example given by uh, Andrew Ung, who's the uh, chief executive of uh, Coursera, uh, that he observed in the feedback from Coursera that uh, a lot of people were getting the same question wrong. And so then he tailored the course to deal with that. And he also observed that a lot of people uh, who looked at a particular web page uh, were m who got the question right. And so you can analyze the effectiveness of the course depending on that data. But in general, the data that we're getting back from MOOCs is, is pretty superficial. You could do a taxonomy of data. At the, at the bottom, you've got the sort of enterprise data, which is just names and addresses, nothing to do with learning. Then you've got behavioral data. And that's the data which Google scoops up in huge volumes. Uh, it's just what you do. Next layer up is you've got what in the SCORM community used to be called interactions data. What you do in the context of a particular activity, what answers you gave, what buttons you clicked. Further up, you've got performance data. When you are, your performance on a particular activity is being evaluated, marks. And right at the top, you've got capability data how good you are at cert doing certain things. Because we don't have very advanced software uh, in the m operating in the MOOCs, the level of data that we have is fairly low. We've got a little bit of superficial performance data, and we've got behavioral data, what web pages you visited. We won't really get good learning analytics until we get better data about people's learning. Um, and that means better software. The final thing that MOOCs are missing, I think, at the moment is credibility. They have had uh, very good levels of credibility. Everyone's been very excited about them. But you may have seen that Sebastian Thrun, who basically started the whole ex-MOOC phenomenon off in the States, recently said that Udacity had a lousy product. Um, and that signaled the change of direction away from massive courses towards more blended um, corporate training courses. Um, and there are a number of other key MOOCs which have been abandoned. So a lot of this, uh, a lot of these, uh, I would call it a fad, uh, is self-feeding, is self feeding, that you have a, a, an element of excitement uh, and people are driving this forwards. The momentum has suddenly gone out of MOOCs. And if you look at the New York Times, or if you look at a lot of tech and learning magazines, they are for <coughs> saying that 2014 will be the year in which MOOCs fade. Now, I am not, I am, passionate about education technology. I think there is a huge opportunity for education technology. And the reason that I am cautious about MOOCs uh, is I think that they are actually recycling a fairly traditional and uninnovative uh, approach to education technology. And I think we need to get on to the stuff that's really going to make the difference, uh, which is development of uh, education-specific software and good peer instructional uh, uh, methodologies. Um, and one of the things we need to do if we're going to achieve that is to make sure that the terminology we use uh, is, is clear and that we mean what we say and that we say what we mean. So I suspect that a lot of what the substance of what Donald says I will agree with. I'm, a, I'm very much in favour uh, of driving this forwards and making sure that we get education technology that democratises learning uh, and really delivers much more effective learning than we are able to do at scale. I haven't seen uh, that the MOOCs are a vehicle to do that yet. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your talk. Okay. Okay. Uh, Crispin reminds me of one of those guys who come in, comes in with a, with a bow and arrow and a quiver arrow, and he fires the arrow at the wall, 
he goes up and draws a bit of chalk around the target and look, goes, look, I've hit a bullseye, <laughs> you know? And I'm hoping to prove that by going through a number of the bullseyes, which he claims to have hit, which are actually not bullseyes in a one. First of all, last year I did a debate, this is true, and the motion of the debate was, it was a joke debate, should we ban all de uh, degrees and diplomas? And I took the side of banning them. But I did give the presentation with a full-size stuffed sheep under my arm. That's how much of a joke it was. I don't really believe we should scrap all universities and all degrees and uh, diplomas. It was a debate. Uh, that's the first example. There are, there are other examples that, uh, 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 there as well. The second thing is the word MOOC. I have no problem with the word MOOC at all. You know, I love it when, you know, I've been waiting all my life, 30 years in the online industry, suddenly this fantastic phenomenon comes along. Five, six million people take learning that never took it before. Who cares if they're called a MOOC? I actually quite like MOOC. It's a bit like Lady, Lady Gaga or something. It's a phenomenon. I love phenomenon. It gives it marketing push. You know, I'm glad the word MOOC exists, and it does those four words capture what I mean. They're massive, they're open, open in spirit. You know, that's what I always like about the democratization of education. I don't like it being closed up in Oxford or Cambridge. I came up, I was brought up similar to this guy at the back in Scotland. Nobody in Scotland ever wanted to go to Oxford or Cambridge, believe me. I did go to an Ivy League in the United States, and believe me, that was a far more interesting experience than Oxford or Cambridge. And it's no accident that Harvard and MIT have pumped $30 million each into MOOCs and using them aggressively, because they are the future, and as far as I'm concerned, not Oxford or Cambridge. I've got the word up, uh, university up here upside down deliberately, because I'm, I'm going to try, I tried to anticipate what Kristen was going to say in terms of that arrow analogy and see if I can counter them, okay? And I've used a common concept here, this sort of flipped university. The notion that MOOCs are flipping things, you'll be aware of the flipped classroom. It's similar to that in many ways. The first thing for me is this is not an idle debate. You know, I'm pretty angry that my twin boys are paying 9,900 a year to go and get slabs of lectures delivered to them with hardly any contact time in the university. I know how poor teaching is in universities. I did the whole thing, Edinburgh University, Ivy League stuff. I've been to those institutions. What is the benchmark here? It's actually quite poor teaching. Linear courses, over long courses, padded out courses. We've had riots in London from students over student fees. We have the collapse, massive graduate unemployment throughout Southern Europe. This is not an idle debating issue. This is a moral issue and a political issue. If we don't make higher education cheaper, we will not enfranchise poorer kids. And that's wrong. And we certainly <coughs> won't be able to enfranchise the people in developing countries. And we do not want to fall into the trap of America, because we are already, we're heading over the next 30 years to a 200 billion pound student loan book. The anticipated payback, uh, sorry, default was 30%, it's 35%, heading towards 40 and it will get to 50. Our future kids will pick up the tab on this, this default. 50% of 200 billion is 100 billion. This is not good news for us. We have to make higher education and other forms of education cheaper. That's why I'm in this industry. That's why I'm here. In America, we have the cost of higher education and tuition going through the roof compared to even the rise in house prices and CBI. We now have credit card debt below the level of student debt in the States, $1 trillion. Obama has panicked and he through the Gates Foundation and other things, is feeding the MOOC industry because he sees it as one, not everything, but one possible solution. So for me, it's a moral issue. Some of the myths here, first of all, that it's a fad and the word MOOC's not right and it's gonna go away. I, I just don't believe this. We have a system that's based on scarcity, the lack of abundance. You know, it's really difficult to get to Oxford and Cambridge. But who gives a shit? That's not what I'm after. I don't want everybody to go <laughs> to Oxford and Cambridge. I want an enfranchised system that suits all sorts of people. The University for Industry, which I'm a trustee, I'm a trustee of City and Guilds. I care also about, remember, only 38% of kids go to university. I care about the other kids that go to further education colleges that's just had 17.5% of its budget ripped out of its guts to go into higher education. I care about the wider uh, area in education. We're talking about universities that are supply-led, scarcity, small numbers, mostly offline. You have to go there. You have to actually pay ridiculous rents for your kids to stay in flats in these places. The, you, you have to turn up at a certain time, period, time, period in your location, and by and large, they're closed. I would much rather the future was demand-led, really demand-led, not supply-led, abundant. I'd like to choose the teachers that I want. You know, I went to university, I had no idea who I was going to be taught by. Some of them were really hopeless, some of them were brilliant. But I'd like to actually choose somebody from Harvard who is the best in the world. You know, why not, if I'm paying for it? 
we're looking at a future as abundant, massive numbers online, anywhere, anytime, and open. And George Siemens was right here when he talked about the MOOC movement being a supply response to a demand problem. Where did these five or six million people come from? They weren't being served by higher education before. They suddenly had this fantastic, and I'm one of them, I've taken six MOOCs. It's been absolutely brilliant experience, picking up on things I never learned in my life before. And I've heard unbelievable stories from other people who have been energized in later in life, you know, in their 50s by this phenomenon. And there's nothing wrong with older people with degrees learning again. That's what we, we, you know the phrase lifelong learning? You, you said yesterday, your brain doesn't suddenly stop and you don't learn any more because it's filled up. We want to keep on learning and this is the way you can do it. And it's entirely relevant to the corporate world as well. The whole thing about dropout, that's right. You know, I'm just amazed that five, six million people have dropped in. <laughs> we'd all be pleased as learning professionals if five million people turned up to our courses voluntarily. You know, that's an absolute amazing, astonishing thing in a way. And some, in some ways it's drop in and it's okay to leave. You know, I, finish, I don't finish every book I start. I, I don't even finish every movie. I'm one of those guys who I don't like it. I walk out the movie, you know. There's loads of things in life we don't start. We don't finish. One of the reasons there's a reasonable amount of dropout is the academics have been designing the courses. Now, you guys in this room know that you wouldn't have a course that was six, eight, ten weeks long, padded with lectures. You wouldn't do that. Academics are just taking the semester model from universities and slamming them out in MOOCs. That's changing dramatically, I should add. They're all quickly learning that courses need to be a lot shorter. We intrinsically know that because we'd, we wouldn't have a job if we had ten-week courses in every subject. You know, nobody would have time to do any work. Sorry, my slide's gone a bit odd here. So stopping is actually rational. It's okay. Some MOOCs I've finished, got the completion certificates. Others halfway. Some I go, oh, no, this is no good. I don't like this. And I drop out immediately. I think that's okay. That's exactly what learning should be like. Why stay right to the end? The interesting data, and talking about the data from MOOCs is far, far more interesting than the data that universities hold on courses, mainly because they've got big numbers. So if you look at the six MOOCs that Edinburgh University did, the data is exemplary. And they've looked at non-active learners versus active learners. Remember, the data is massively polluted at the moment. There's loads of people just dipping in and having a look, window shopping, toe dipping. You've got to sort of separate that data because it's a new phenomenon from the active learners who really stay the course. And then, the, of course, you find that the completion rates are a much higher percentage than you actually thought. Uh, and do people like this? I mean, the data from Edinburgh, I really recommend the report. They were really open with the data. Absolutely, the majority of people, the blue is yes, the course exceeded my expectations. Yes, completely, to some extent, green. But most of the people who do this stuff really love it. I saw a guy at Educa who, who stood up in front of the debate with Chris Bowles, and he said, when he finished his first MOOC, he cried. He cried, a grown man my age. He was so delighted to have gone through this novel experience on his own that he burst into tears when he got his completion certificate. That's how powerful this can be. The, the, the idea that they're all graduates. If you, I've been in the tech industry for 30 years, and it's true of every new thing that comes along that the early adopters are pretty techy people. I'm one of those people, you know? I can't wait to try out Google Glass. I would actually wear Google Glass in Brighton where I live, even though I would be ridiculed by everybody. Because that's the nature of technology. The whole point of the Rogers work on adoption curves is that you get this initial, the innovators and early adopters in these systems. And of course, what you've got to do is cross the chasm into the maj early majority and late majority. This is true of almost everything in the tech area, and that's where we are on MOOCs. And, and don't imagine that dropout is something that doesn't happen in universities. In America, the Harvard 2012 study shows that nearly half of America's college students drop out before receiving a degree. Nearly half of them drop out the main system anyway. <laughs> so dropout isn't something that's unique to MOOCs. And remember, I'm not, when I go and do a MOOC, it's very low commitment. You know, it's free. It takes me about 30 seconds to sign up. I'm not moving to New York. I've not paid 9,900 pounds. I've not got a flat. I've not made a life commitment. So it's, it's hardly surprising that people are a bit lazy fair about popping in and popping out. It's like a library in a sense. Then we have the, you know, this whole notion of, I think it's a big mistake to think that MOOCs are a re replacement for the 18-year-old undergraduate model. When people talk about HE, they always have this 18-year-old undergraduate model, the three- and four-year degrees model, and that's shifted already. Much older demographics of people are doing degrees. And I think what's fantastic about MOOCs is the way they've broken out HE. So you have people like Adidas. I don't know if you've seen SAP's MOOC. They built a whole platform, a really sophisticated platform. And again, that's for their customers. In the corporate world, MOOCs are perfectly applicable. The best MOOC I've taken so far has been a Google MOOC on search. It was relatively short, but it was good, and it was pointed, and it really massively amplified 
my skills in that area. We have vocational MOOCs. As a charity, I've just funded half a million dollar MOOC on functional maths, not GCSE maths, the maths for kids that go to colleges, you know, the vocational stuff. Uh, we've also got people doing this stuff in high school and secondary schools as well. So it's not, this is not really about replacing HE. It's another one of those dr draw the chalk around the circle targets, no way. Also, the X MOOC and C MOOC taxonomy is completely out the window now. That, that's just so old school that now. If you really go and play, look in MOOC land or the MOOCosphere, there's a huge range of MOOCs available here. Uh, there are the connectedness C MOOCs around, and then a bit like the transfer MOOCs at the top. It, it, is Stephen da the Stephen Downs distinction. But you've got synchronous, asynchronous, adaptive MOOCs with highly al algorithmic Google type engines sitting behind them. You've got game MOOCs, you've got mini MOOCs, you've got loads of MOOCs out there. And that's okay. That's good because they're getting more sophisticated, more diverse, more focused on specific target audiences. We can't carry on with a 10 long semester university MOOC with loads of lectures in them. Some people actually like that, and I think it's okay. I don't want to get rid of those, but I like to see other species of MOOCs. And then when you look at the, sort of people, the people who are doing this, it's a huge range of ages, and this is what's interesting here. It's not about the 18-year-old undergraduate. It's about a huge range of people, and actually the big range is here uh, uh, in the middle, as you can see, in the, uh, people in 25 to 34 age. Poor pedagogy. Now, let me tell you, I took the Sebastian Thrun MOOC on AI, okay? And it was the hardest course I've ever sat in my life. Really, really tough. In fact, I think it was a better course than any course I had at the two universities I attended. And one was a top-level UK institution, Ivy League in the States. It was amazingly challenging intellectually. And I, and I think there's a great danger of people who haven't actually taken MOOCs through at the end to underplay the sophistication of the pedagogy in some of these MOOCs. And also the peer assessment and how sophisticated that can be. And this is coming of age because there are other pedagogic techniques. The great thing about MOOCs is it's forcing people in educational institutions to think in innovative ways about pedagogy, to do machine-based essay marking, which edX and Harvard and MIT are applying with great success. How, how great would that be for academics? Do you know any academics who love taking a bundle of essays home, or teachers in secondary schools who love marking when they go home and see their family on a Friday night? I don't know any. They complain bitterly about it. If we can find a solution to that problem, that would be great by automating assessment. And of course, the old world of, you know, the one hour lecture, that's simply because the Babylonians has a sexadecimal number system. You know, there's nothing to do with psychology or learning the one hour lecture at a university, just completely for the convenience of the, of the people who teach. Fixed time, fixed location, once only, you know, I'll give you this lecture, I won't even record it. How stupid is that? Anybody in the learning industry knows that you have to give people repeated access to content or they won't learn a damn thing. And yet academics insist on once only. And I've said this a million times. If you were a novelist, you wouldn't say, I'm going to read my novel out once. You better take notes, by the way, because I'm not going to put it in a book. If I was a journalist, you wouldn't, and I've written an article, I wouldn't say, you better listen, I'm going to read it once because I'm not going to publish it in a newspaper. Oh, no. But that's what academics do. One bite of the cherry. It's stupid. Nothing in the psychology of learning backs this up. The truth of the matter is, if you go and do MOOCs, you find that it's shorter videos. They don't play the one-hour uh, game. Less is more anytime, anywhere. Many times you can go back and retake stuff. It's all accessible for when you want to take it, especially in the more asynchronous ones. And there's a big focus on content and brilliant, brilliant data coming out the back of them. Another interesting thing about the videos, which I think MOOCs has been a breakthrough on, Sebastian Thrun uh, and Peter Norvik at Google don't appear much, actually, on their videos, same as Salman Khan. You don't see Salman Khan's head stuck in his math slides here because when you teach kids maths, I've been a maths teacher, you want them to pick up the semantic knowledge. Maths is about symbolic semantic knowledge and perseverance. The head is just noise. <laughs> and these guys were smart, smarter than most academics because you don't want to hear people talk about maths. You want to see maths being done. And that's where a lot of the videos are superior in MOOCs compared to that sort of YouTube EDU stuff. Have you ever tried to find good lectures on YouTube EDU? It's just full of rubbish, things you would never in a million, you go, why, did I listen to this stuff when I was at university? So there's this sort of stuff, really detailed, highly sophisticated mathematics and algorithmic work on the Sebastian Thrun. And if you do a programming MOOC, you download real code, you write code, you get the analysis of that code. It's an amazingly sophisticated experience as a learner. Myth number five that is weak on assessment, far from it. Uh, the truth of the matter is, I can go to a British university and get a degree by writing a few essays. 
That's the truth of the matter. Long form essay is still an obsession in our university system and a hopeless method of assessment. Uh, still writing it on pen and paper, by the way. We can go into that in a lot of detail about the weaknesses of it. The truth of the matter is that it is a weakness of MOOCs in the sense that you've got, let's say, the 100,000 people on a MOOC. You can't obviously have the academic marking or anything. But the peer assessment is amazing. If you do the Future Learn MOOC, every piece of little short work you put in, they don't do the long form essay thing, gets assessed by six other people, and then you have to assess six other people. And it's an amazingly powerful experience. A lot of it's moderated in the discussion forums by academics as well. They have discussion on every screen in Future Learn. So this is a much richer experience than you might imagine. And I don't know about your experience at university, but have you ever tried stopping a lecturer at the end of a lecture to ask them a question? Or did you have the same experience as me that they couldn't wait to get out of that room and they have very little interest in the undergraduates and that actually getting access to academics in an, uh, an educational institution in the UK is quite difficult. Uh, and you speak to them. I have a lot of friends in that area. Do they like teaching? Not a lot. Another thing is certification. The data from Edinburgh, 308,000 people, an amazing number of people who did six MOOCs, course there are MOOCs. Certification, well, why did you do the MOOC? Only 33% were interested in certification. This is not about certification. I'm 57 years old. I'm not in the slightest bit interested in a bit of paper. Not in the slightest. And of course, 66% of people are like me. I'm not doing this for a bit of paper. I think it was sort of tragic, that statement, that all education should be about certification and bits of paper. Is that what it's like? I mean, I worked in corporate training for 20, 30 years. It was, there was, a, by and large, a fair degree of disinterest in certification because you want competence, you want, you know, you want other things in life. And sure, we print out lots of Mickey Mouse little bits of paper at the end of your learning courses, but it wasn't really about that. If your heart's in learning, your heart's in intrinsic learning and lifelong learning, not on certification. Certification is okay, I think, especially in the developing world where people really need that proof for employers. I'm not against it at all, but don't let it be the tail that wags the dog in Mookland. And in actual fact, the assessment in Mookland is pretty sophisticated. You can get a straightforward, uh, no like me, I'm not bothered about certification. You can get certification of completion, certification of mastery, real skills-based ones, which is interesting. I can't remember that. University attended certifications of distinction. You get that 2-1 uh, first type stuff that happens as well. University credits are starting. Georgia University have just started uh, Georgia Tech. No slouches in that area. Proctored online. I've taken an assessment on this one where you get your PC and uh, you dial in, set an appointment, and you show your webcam around the room. The guy asks you personal questions. There's some digital identification and authentication about you as a person. And then they watch and track your eye movements, and you sit the exam online. It's cool. It's brilliant. Why not? Why don't we do more of that? Or you can go through Pearson View and most of the Coursera and Udacity courses to one of their 4,000 centres and set a real exam. These are all options that are available in Mookland. I can't remember hardly any of this being available in the universities I went to. And I'm not too sure they're available in any of the universities my kids go to. <coughs> Myth number six, it can't be monetized. Well, you know, this is not <coughs> about venture capitalists making money, really. I mean, I can't, you know, academics ask me, well, it can't be monetized. I say, well, if how's your current course monetized? You don't monetize your current course. Why are you insisting on monetizing real academic courses? You know, it's not like a market stall where you're selling something like objects. This is a real moral issue about opening up and democratizing education. I don't want them to be expensive. You know, I don't want this massive loan book here. And the fact is there are loads of ways in which the economics of MOOCs make sense, whether it be making them cheap. They're not for profits. I'm a member of a charity who's just given half a million for a MOOC. In the, in the US, there are loads of charities that pump money into MOOC land. There are for profits, of course. I think that's quite good in terms of hedging the risk anyway. There is payment, sponsorship, recruitment, revenues already part of the landscape. Coursera will be a profitable country, uh, company within two years. You can pay for certification, sponsorship. More students, of course. The big win, if you just talk about universities, is attracting more international students, keeping in touch with alumni who feed money back to you. <coughs> Uh, more local students, and organisational savings. You might not need as many faculty in the future as you currently have if you get this right, if you're serving hundreds of thousands of people. Many academics will go through a full academic career having taught only a few thousand students in their entire 30 to 40 year career. Sebastian Thrun's course was 169,000. These are 21 different ways in which 
the economic equation. Well, we'll go through this now, now in detail. And then the last one, there's nothing new technically here. This is really interesting. No innovation, don't believe it. If you really look at the platforms that are being developed for MOOCs at the moment, you guys will be familiar with the technology be behind LMSs and perhaps people like Blackboard, you know, the traditional LMS land. They are totally unsuited to MOOCs. They cannot cope with the scalability that the newer models can. And the great thing about these new technical platforms is they cope with low-cost, scalable delivery across the globe. I'll explain why that's so. Traditional things like Blackboard and Desire to, Desire to Learn have just had massive layoffs. Blackboard's in real trouble financially because people are clicking onto the newer MOOC platforms. Some of them, like edX, are absolutely free because they're open source and sophisticated. But by and large, they take a different coding view. It gets a bit technical here. You know, they're really Django, Python, you know, Ruby and Rails type builds there, much more flexible and agile than the old systems, cloud hosted and elastically scale in terms of the money and delivery. This makes them much cheaper. And then they have this MVC framework thing where they're separating the front end out from the back end logic and so on that makes it much more interesting in the future. So we have a much more interesting set of platforms that are really suited to 21st learning compared to our old LMS models. Poor evaluation. The data on this stuff is absolutely fascinating now. If you look at the data that's coming through just through watching vid videos, there's a guy here in Slovenia who has 100,000 academic lectures online, captured from MOOCs and all sorts of sources, and he just watches where people drop out in the video. And then he goes back to the academic and says, look, this is where they dropped out. This is where we got them back up. What he's found, actually, is it's key slides that matter, not the lecturer at all. It's nothing to do with what they say. It's key slides that matter. And he goes back to the academics, and they improve their lectures. This is the power of data in terms of improving an overall course. It really can happen with video. And of course, big data in education is not really big data. It's really just a little or large data. Universities collect hardly any data. They, they really have absolutely no idea what data is. We're not talking about Google levels of data. Here. We're talking about scores, outputs and inputs. They don't even know how many kids turn up to lectures. In the British system, they don't even count that. So they have no idea how effective lectures are anyway. At least MOOCs absolutely know what people are actually doing in the courses here. And it's down here that it really matters. Learners using data to feedback and improve the courses. So there are four ways forward here. You know, we can ignore this stuff. I think it's OK. If you're a university and you ignore this, I'd be worried. I'd be worried because the danger is other people will cannibalize your market. You can pilot, do one, I think that's a mistake. <laughs> Often becomes a focal point for academics to attack. A whole number of things here, so I'll go quicker because I'm running out of time. Google searches, blue one, online learning, red one, MOOCs. I think MOOCs win in the battle here. Come back to this point and end. This is not really about these nitpicking points about the, whether that form of online assessment is superior to this. It's about real people with a real thirst of knowledge advancing themselves in life. And the fact that they're not free, but they're like the NHS, they're free at the point of delivery, and that matters. And we will find ways of paying for them because the cost per learner is in pence and cents and not £9,900 a year. Thanks for listening. Thank you. What we're going to do now is not have questions. I want you to have, well, you can ask questions, but they're not going to respond to them immediately. They respond to them at the end. So has anyone got a statement, a point they want to make about MOOCs? Would anyone like to share an experience or give us a very anti, very pro, whatever your, your feelings are? Yeah, go for it. Um, so one quick suggestion would be to call them MOOLs, as uh, just replace the course with the word L for learning. That, for me, would, be, uh, would help. And also, uh, I took my first MOOC, um, which was actually about um, using games in learning. And I found it amazing. And there was, even though the people um, who were running it um, contributed, I got a huge amount out from the peer-to-peer -peer interactions that happened in between the sessions. It was a bit long. I'd agree with that. I think shorten it would help. How many people have taken a MOOC in this room? How many people in this room? Put your hand up. How many people who haven't taken one after hearing this are curious and they're going to have a look? <laughs> That's great. Who is sorry? Yes. Quick one. There we go. Just a, a quick question about this often quoted dropout rate thing. So, so you, you made the point that, that, that it's a problem because it's such a big dropout. Donald was saying actually it's not a problem because loads of people at least started. 
I'm just curious why it's compared to people who actually sign up at universities and maybe it should be compared with people who've applied for prospectus from a university or something like that. So, so it's just expressing an interest to, yeah. to start. So, so it doesn't really feel like it's comparing like with like. Maybe you should be comparing, if you do want to compare like with like, perhaps it's people who've made it for, through the first third anyway and they counted as the officially starting, they've made the same effort as somebody who's actually been accepted in a university course. Okay, I'd, I'd like to come a little bit on, on the dropout rate um, and the statistics, the numbers you get might be very misleading. So I'll just cite the, the um, aspect of my son, who's now 14, last year he was 13. He signed up for a course on aeronautical engineering because he thought it was interesting, he likes things that fly. The university level course, he got in, a, he did about 10 minutes of it and he realized he didn't understand any of the maths. The net effect of that, from the MOOC's point of view, he was a dropout, total failure. From his point of view, he then, since then, has been totally focused on learning the requisite maths on Khan, and he's going to go back and do it when he's ready. So that's, that's really interesting. It doesn't, it's exactly that point. Because it's not a big deal to get in, it's just, if you're interested in learning, you have that opportunity and you can learn what you need to. So his love of aeronautics has been extended rather than killed. So basically, and, and he's got a deeper understanding of what aeronautics is about. Sure. Who? Anyone? Yes. Go. I suppose to follow on from that point, I mean, I admit to being a serial dropout individual with several MOOCs, and there's been a variety of reasons for that. I think one of the big issues at MOOCs at the moment is quality, um, going back to the whole uh, argument about, you know, how they're constructed. Sometimes you get really good engagement, and I've done actually one of the University of Edinburgh ones that was done extremely well. And other times it's just like a, an OER, an open educational resource, where they're presenting information to you and just, just no interaction. And you just treat it like a resource, and you drop out once you've gotten what you want from it. So again, if you get the quality right, that makes a big difference to it as well. Could, could I come back to that? I think it's a very, you know, really important point here. I think the MOOC people are going through the same experience that we went through 20, 30 years ago. In other words, you don't just get somebody who's idle to design e-learning. You get some good people who know what they're doing. But they're making all the mistakes that we've witnessed over you know, the last three decades in e-learning. And I was getting amateurs to do the production. Apart from Udacity are quite good at this, actually. They are really prescriptive about uh, quality, production quality and instructional design. Some don't get anyone to do the production. The, the, the lecturer is sat in his study with, with a <laughs> webcam on him, so told, deliver 20-minute segments. Now, that's never going to have very high production values. It will be interesting. Yes, over there. So, uh, <coughs> go, go, go. Okay. Um, one of the things uh, at the corporate level, we are doing some things at the corporate level, we are calling them MOOCs, and I was a little bit worried because I thought this is something uh, that has to be done in a university. I'm not so sure if I'm right or not, but I just want to know your point of view about it. By the way, we've launched one and we've had like uh, 40,000 people <laughs> attending immediately. <laughs> so. Fair point. Where? Sorry. Got you. Thanks, Nigel. Um, I'm doing a lot of work in and around the corporate MOOC arena, and um, there was quite a bit of stuff there that you, both of you said resonated with me. And I think it, you know, we always revert back to type, which is measurement. And um, it's, you know, we can crunch that data and that measurement any way we like. It's, it's interesting from my perspective when um, we talk about completion rates and everybody does, and we're less than 10%. In that, what we do know though, is that 75% of all people that sign up on MOOCs do one piece of learning. However long that might be, they, they do one piece. In the corporate arena, that's a success, as opposed to the completion of. Because if we're moving into a world of where we talk about and we're encouraging personalized learning, and actually the learner's driving that, what's the biggest benefit? The actual completion or doing some personal learning? I don't know, it's an open question. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to uh, uh, share an, a negative experience of doing a MOOC. Uh, there were 10,000 people that started the MOOC that I was on, but the dropout rate was reasonably high. And because it was a global audience, when we came to the areas of social interaction and going on Twitter and things like that, there were very few people left who could speak English to make it worthwhile doing. So there was a, it all just sort of fell apart at that, at that point. After how long? Um, probably after about two months. 
It was interesting on the social internet, the data from Edinburgh, there's six MOOCs, was that only 14% of the people over the 308,000 staff who'd actually did any of the social interaction thing, and it's very course specific. You know, and, in fact, on the Sebastian Thune thing, which is a high-end maths sort of algorithmic thing, actually a lot of those people weren't interested in the social interaction as they probably aren't in, in, in real life, like, you know, but the, it was all nitpicking the course. There wasn't really much learning going on in the social well, dimension there. Oh, I see, yeah, yeah, that, that, that's when it does start to collapse and you don't have the numbers. Good point. It's kind of hard to keep going back, but we, we can <laughs> forget to bloody count. Does anyone, are we okay? Ready to move on? What was it, the, the last stage of the, we've got, we've got eight minutes, so I'm going to give four minutes to John and four minutes to Christian to bring the rounded up, conclude, and make any last points. And I'm going to time them, because uh, I want to be fair. So, John, you've got four minutes. Four minutes, okay. I want to pick up on something. Uh, I wasn't going to uh, do this, but on the corporate MOOC thing, I think there's a fantastic opportunity here. You know, I'm not that fussed about it being all HE. There's one area that I did a lot of work in in the medical field, which is customer training. I think the MOOC thing is absolutely made for that. Actually, loads of corporates did this historically anyway. You know, we actually delivered real learning. Google have become exemplary at this, where the customer, you know, you can, you can do real courses on uh, Google Analytics and Google Search and so on, delivered by Google. They are real MOOCs and they work. I think there's another fantastic opportunity in terms of CPD for people, interested managers and so on in organizations where you're not locking into the corporate structure necessarily and you're getting, a, and I know you just collapse a little bit, but you're getting a much wider, more diverse view of business if you do it. And there's some really good business courses out there. I mean, hundreds of them now on everything from finance through marketing and so on. I think it's another fantastic opportunity. I also think having, you know, I'm an investor in small tech companies. It's what I do for a living now. And they are an absolute boon for SMEs. You know, SMEs have no budget for training, no time for it, but they're full of really enthusiastic kids who want to learn. And you just point them to one of these things and it's like they have an amazing reaction. They have no idea they exist, but a quick sales and marketing course for a 23-year-old technical guy who's running a company who knows nothing about it, it's an absolute boon for them. And I want to really just round off with this idea that this whole MOOC phenomenon, the sort of Lady Gaga thing, is not about the 10 week semester course in a university. It's not about the 18 year old undergraduate. It's about the whole of the population. We've got kids who are starting to do MOOCs. If you look at the Future Learn platform, they actually have entry courses to university designed for secondary school kids. That's great, we're getting that diversification going. It is for universities as well. If you speak to, to Haywood, the guy who built all the, the MOOCs in Edinburgh. That has changed forever, University of Edinburgh's attitude to online learning. They will be doing 25 master's degrees online next year. It's changing the way in which universities see the delivery of content. And that will be their biggest legacy because MOOCs is not online learning. You know, it's a subset of it. And MOOCs are having this huge catalytic effect on all organizations in terms of wakening up to the future that we know is waiting on the table because we know about this stuff. We know it works, we know it's cheaper. So it's having a catalytic effect back in the organizations. Most universities, every single chancellor on the planet knows the word MOOC and is looking at it and considering it. Even in Cambridge, you said Cambridge is not looking at MOOCs. Well, I, I happen to know this because the company I'm a director of have been into Cambridge and they are scanning the horizon for MOOC platforms and I know exactly what they're after and what they're gonna buy. Everybody's doing this now. Because their hand has been pushed, it's been a supply market. They could do what they want in the past. They got given big checks. They get about half, a, you know, 500 million a year, some of these institutions, and they just spend it. That's okay, I, I, I'm, I have no problem with that model. Fund, the public funding of universities, I think, is a, a valuable thing. But they do need to change their habits a bit, let's be honest, as learning professionals. It is absolutely appalling to go in and get slabs of three lectures a week and not even be slightest bit interested in whether the kids even turn up or not and, and not record them at all. We know this is not good news. We know that it's not worth that 9,900 and the other six, seven grand a year that you've got to pay for the experience. So in terms of the decentralization of education, especially reaching out to, I was in Africa last year, I'll be Africa this year, they absolutely welcome this because most of the people there have no chance of getting higher education at all. There isn't even a starting block for them. And if we're going to get to those people, we're not going to do this old educational colonial thing and say, save up 9,900 and come to England. This is all wrong. We need to go to them. And we should be taking some of the aid budget and putting it into education because we know that the education of women leads to real improvements. We know 
that it leads to, uh, uh, to real economic improvements in those countries. So we have a chance here, a window now, to do something real, as opposed to some university going and setting up a campus in Kampala and hoping for the best. Let me take that. Okay, let me, um, I haven't spoken for some time. Uh, let me just reiterate some of the things I think we agree on so I can then focus on what we disagree on. Um, I agree with the aspiration. I agree that a lot of universities and other training educations don't do it very well. They don't handle scale very well. So you end up with lectures um, and simply exposition and no, not enough contact time, not enough interaction. I agree this represents uh, a key opportunity for innovation. Uh, part, I, I'm not sure it's necessarily to do with MOOCs. I think it's to do with some of the uh, developments in cloud computing and mobile computing. So we have one-to-one -one ratios, which is very important. Um, and we, we have a, a real opportunity at the moment to innovate. And some of that innovation may be stimulated by MOOCs. I think the MOOC phenomenon may actually provoke innovation. Um, and I agree that this is a, a methodology that may work for adult learners who are already, uh, uh, have already got their degrees and have already got their basic skills. The guy who cried at Online Educa Berlin, um, the reason he was crying was he made such good friends. And you know, he was losing all his friends, and that's great. Um, but that's not actually the equivalent uh, to what you're doing at university when you're trying to get basic skills at university. Uh, I think there's a great danger saying this really work works for adult learners uh, who, are, um, who have already got their basic skills and trying to transfer that uh, to the university level. Uh, so what I don't agree with uh, on the MOOCs have, as have been presented uh, is firstly the implication that you can get rid of the teacher uh, with one-to-one -one interaction at some point. You can do it if you already have your basic skills, but feedback is critical. Uh, and where are you going to get that feedback from? Are you going to trust peer feedback? Um, in my view, where you've got uh, serious hard skills to learn, you need somewhere in that mix uh, tutor feedback. You can systematize some of that feedback with good course design, and I agree with the comments on good course design. Um, but too often ed in ed tech, we've left it all to the instructional designer to come up with everything in designing the course. And there has been not enough investment uh, in the software uh, that systematizes uh, a, a lot of those interactions. Uh, some of that software may come out of this process. Uh, I think that we are at an exciting time. I think it's certainly worth watching what's going on in MOOCs. Uh, but I think that what will emerge out of MOOCs are not MOOCs. I don't think they'll be massive, I think they'll be blended, and I don't think they will get rid of the teacher. Thank you. Good, thank you very much. Couldn't say that. Um, basically, you should be out there discovering, checking, checking it out for yourself, because everything everyone said is true. MOOCs are, are hugely contradictory. You can find good, you can find awful, you can find exceptional and brilliant, but they're not gonna go away. That's the one thing I would disagree with Chris. I don't think 2013 was the year of the MOOC, 2014 is the year they disappear. I think there, there will be, as always, interesting consolidations and developments and fragmentation and interesting stuff going around. It's too, too big attraction at the moment, I think, to just fade away. So can we thank two excellent, passionate, committed speakers who, thank goodness, didn't come in with exactly the same, we, we totally disagree, and we totally agree perspective. We had some good, solid disagreement and some really interesting, debatable points. And thank you for your, <coughs> your contributions as well. It went very, very quickly. And I'm sorry if you wanted to say something you didn't have an opportunity. We're out of time. Safe journeys back. Thanks for staying to the end of the conference. I hope it was worth it. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.